Hey, what's up guys, it's Nick here, and today I wanted to try something a little different. I'm gonna have clips from different movies and even TV shows to help explain some psychological concepts. Some movies and shows you might know and like, and maybe some not so much, but either way, the goal is to break it down as we always do through psychology and science. So without further ado, let's get into it and break it down. I'm lame compared, like I fought a Russian guy in a like a rhinoceros machine. Can, can we rewind it back to the I'm lame part? Because you are not. No, thanks. No, yeah, I appreciate it. I'm not saying I'm lame. But I'm just, just saying the like... self-talk maybe we should, you yeah. know. Listen. Because uh... you're, you're amazing. Just to take it in for a minute. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can you, take it in. No, I can take you it in. are amazing. I can take it in. You are amazing. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Will you say it? All right. So this first clip is from Spider-Man No Way Home. I saw this a few weeks ago and I saw this scene and I'm like, wait a minute. That's an example of self-talk. Now, it's negative self-talk because you saw Andrew Garfield's version of Peter Parker not being as enthusiastic since he didn't fight space aliens and all different types of villains, and he put himself down. And then Tobey Maguire's version of Spider-Man came and said, hey man, don't, don't talk about yourself like that. So in sports psychology, this is talked about a lot. Self-talk is basically the inner dialogue we have in our head with ourselves. And it's funny when I teach this to my clients because when you think about people saying negative stuff to you outside of yourself, you probably wouldn't tolerate it. You probably would even get mad and in some cases wanna fight them. And it's funny because we wouldn't allow that to external people but when we say it to ourselves, it's all of a sudden okay. Now, with self-talk, it seems kind of like, okay, well, whatever. Who cares about what you say to yourself? But think about it. Thoughts are actually a pattern of neurons that make up what the actual thought is. So every time you think that particular thought in your head, these neurons have to fire and the connection gets stronger. Heavy in theory. Neurons that fire together, wire together, meaning it gets more routine. It becomes your default mode. So if you're always thinking, I can't do this or I'm no good, it eventually becomes the automatic pattern that you want to go to when things don't go your way. Way. You can see how this could be detrimental in a sports situation, but even in just regular life, we can say hundreds of thousands of words per day. So if you're saying things that aren't beneficial, I like to say productive self-talk other than positive because sometimes people have pseudo confidence and say things that aren't really going to be helpful. Think about things that are productive. So if you say, I'll never be able to accomplish that, it doesn't mean to just go over the top and say, I can do anything. I'm unstoppable. Well, you can, but you can say something more along the lines of, if I was able to put my mind to it, I can eventually achieve it. That way you're setting a tone that it can be done, but you also give room to gradually build up to it. So that's what self-talk really is about. You can practice these things by making lists, not necessarily affirmations, but actual scripts that say what needs to be accomplished or what needs to be done and how you can lead up to it. So great job, Spider-Man No Way Home. I didn't expect this scene. And when I saw this scene, I immediately said, I could use this. Let's go to the next one. Just wait. It's wicked fast and damn near impossible to see. What do I do with it? You catch it. Before the other team's seeker. You catch this, the game is over. You catch this, Potter. And we win. All right, this one's from Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. I read this book back in, I wanna say fourth to fifth grade. It was like 1998, 99. And you can see how old I am, right? I just dated myself. But basically this particular scene, it was very short to the point, is something called saccades. So saccades are eye jumps one place to another. Now, the reason I bring this in because you're thinking vision, What's that have to do with the brain? For those who don't know, the eye is taking about 80% of your external sensory, meaning your brain is wired for vision. When it takes in the visual image, it goes to the back of your head in a region of the brain called the occipital lobe. It rearranges the image so it can be turned into electrical impulses so your brain can then make sense of it. Now, the reason I brought this scene, you can see that Harry's quickly tracking the, the snitch from where it's going left to right, up and down, while the other guy, he's basically like, where to go, where to go? So when we talk about Sakai's, it's being able to track it quickly and efficiently getting your eyes to one place to another. Now you can train your eyes to be more proficient and this is something that sometimes I use in my training with my clientele. So, great scene. <laughs> it's 
Squid Games. Now this show, I'm not gonna lie at first, I didn't really get into it. It started slow, but I'm patient, so I was able to wait for it to pick up, and when it did, it did. Now, this particular scene uh, was the sugar honeycomb scene, and everyone who watched this show, you saw how intense this was, and that's why I like this for this particular skill called cognitive flexibility. Now, in the scene, they're given a task, they're given a cookie that has different types of shapes. Now, if you know how Squid Games works, no spoilers, but obviously if you heard of it, you know it's a death game. So if you fail the task, you die. So that adds so much pressure, but the task involved them having to stencil out whatever shape was drawn into the cookie. Now, if you were given a shape like a square, you had a probability of surviving that was much higher or a triangle, things like that because they have straight edges, your polygons, right? But any curved shapes or shapes that have multiple lines and edges like a star, even though they're straight edges, it's a lot of them. A square and triangle probably the best thing you could get. But if you got a circle, probably didn't look too good for you. In this case, the main character, he got an umbrella. Not exactly a common shape and it definitely was pretty difficult to do. But if you notice, when time is about to tick out and the pressure's at its highest, remember, he dies if he does not get this. He's able to think, stenciling it out like that could break the cookie. So he noticed when he was sweating and he saw the sunlight, he's like, wait a minute, if I wet it just a little bit, it'll make the edges softer and I can scrape it out easier and just push it through. Now this flexible thinking ended up saving his and a few others lives as they saw what he was doing. Now with cognitive flexibility, this is being able to shift your thinking. If one way doesn't work, you have to shift to another. Problem solving, creativity, these are all the things that's entailed in cognitive flexibility. Someone who has high cognitive flexibility is usually good at leadership because they have to solve problems, get people out of situations and be solution focused. Now in this case, you saw he was able to do it not only because it was time but he had a very morbid result if he didn't do it efficiently and that added extra stress and the cognitive flexibility is housed in the prefrontal cortex that region of the brain is where cognitive flexibility is localized so this means that in the fight or flight response which he definitely was in this heightens your sympathetic nervous system which makes your heart rate increase your respiratory rate increase breathing faster your blood pressure spikes so you're basically in a position where the brain doesn't really want to think it wants to just act and a lot of people did that and got killed. But he was able to calm that down and focus and think on the pressure. So this scene exemplified a lot more than what it really put on to be to the general audience. And I definitely saw this as a great piece for breaking it down. I think it's gonna cool down. You go. Huh? Yeah, I don't see many of these Easter eggs on the road. Yeah, once you buy one, you see them everywhere. Oh yeah. So this movie came out about 15, 16 years ago and I heard of it and has my name in the title. My name is Nicholas Davenport or Nick. And I never really watched it. So I ended up stumbling across it about a month ago. And this particular scene caught my attention because they mentioned the Yugo, which is a, a car that got some notoriety in like the, the late 80s, early 90s. And they said, you don't see them everywhere. And he was like, if you see one, you start seeing them all the time. And this is kind of true because if you ever bought a new car, you notice that, wait a minute, I see this Honda Civic everywhere now, but you didn't really notice it before. And this is no coincidence. This is not an increase in sales of whatever car you might've bought. It just means that that car is now relevant to you. So therefore you're more privy to seeing it because your brain is now wired to need to know it because now it's your car. Now this phenomenon occurs because something called the RAS, the Recticular Activation System. Now the RAS is typically for wakeful states. Think about how a computer goes into sleep mode when you don't use it for a while. So this helps us focus our energy when we need to calm down or get ready to focus our attention because that takes brain power but it also helps with how we attend to certain things think about a flashlight in the dark wherever the light's pointed is what you're going to see and this is kind of how the RAS can work so that car that you're seeing is because now that light's pointing towards the Dodge Challenger the Lamborghini whatever it is is now focused on that now you can take this over to regular life because a lot of people use self-talk that may be unproductive and I'll link those together so if you're saying things like oh, I'll never find a good man or a good woman to date, or I'll never find a good job. Guess what happens? Your brain says, wait, no good jobs? You don't need to worry about that? So the focus shifts. You can't see what you're not looking for, figuratively and literally. So when you put your attention on things that aren't relevant to your goal, you therefore wire your brain to be like, hey, we don't need to see that. It's easy to overlook these things. You might think that's kind of crazy, but that's how it works. We can only give so much attention to what we see and take in information every day. So it has to be selective. And if we automatically weed things out, it says, cool, no stress for us. The brain's gonna say, don't focus on that. You can miss what's right in front of you.
So we're back to Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. Now this particular scene I liked a lot because they were tangled in the plant and as you saw as they got more stressed and worried the plant got tighter and when Hermione said hey just calm down relax you saw how she was released and eventually Harry would do the same but Ron kept on stressing and it got tighter and Hermione had the freedom using a spell. Now this kind of depicts the parasympathetic and the sympathetic nervous system. So we talk about these nervous systems One's to get you heightened and ready for action for the fight or flight response, that's the sympathetic nervous system. And the other one's to bring you back to baseline, the parasympathetic nervous system. So when the sympathetic nervous system acts, you're talking about the flood of epinephrine or adrenaline, norepinephrine, cortisol. These are different hormones and neurotransmitters that are used to help your body get ready for action. That means faster heart rate, the constriction of muscles and blood vessels, the ability to take in more oxygen more rapidly. These are all things that we need because we wanna keep going our body needs to be able to keep functioning and not stop. Now, if you see in the scene, he got more tense, that's exactly what happens. Now, in a figurative sense, when you get more stressed out, you bring more worry upon yourself because now you're just inviting all the external thoughts that don't help. And as you saw, he got more frustrated. He was unable to get out of a situation. Now, there's ways to bring down the sympathetic response and activate the parasympathetic nervous system. Now, there's something called box breathing, for example. You take in, inhale about four to five seconds, you hold at the top about four to five seconds and release about four to five seconds. This will actually trigger something called the vagus nerve that will calm down you physiologically because you can't physically and mentally be stressed at the same time. Now, of course, you can still be worrying in your actual head. That's not going to go away just because you breathe. But if you're physically relaxed and your heart rate comes down, your breathing slows down, now you can at least give a chance to think better. It doesn't guarantee that you will think better, but if you slow down that breathing, calm down the sympathetic response, invoke the parasympathetic nervous system, and allow yourself to think clearly, you have a better chance. You can train this, and the more you train this box breathing strategy, it'll be easier to set that parasympathetic response because once again, like I said before, you make it your default mode. You're quicker to go to that calmer, reaction versus getting all hyped up like Ron did and getting more entrenched in the danger. Best of luck to you on, on an upcoming play. I'll be playing with your mama tonight. 62. Move, 22, hut! Our drop back. Looks like a screen pass. 62, 62, there you are. I love my mama very much. Now you know that. So Waterboy, it's an all-time classic football movie. It's hilarious. Adam Sandler did a great job. It's probably one of his most iconic roles. In this scene, you see he gives some well wishes to his opponent. They're entrenched in a game that's pretty close. The opponent then says something offensive about his mom. And if you recall his movie, he was a big mama's boy. So he got immediately offended. Now this is something called sledging. Sledging is a fancy word for trash talk. I've talked about this on my other channels, such as the Mind Body One page. And sledging or trash talk gets into your head. Cricketers started this concept, but it became obviously something big in every sport. Now, it can be very useful because if you know your opponent is sensitive or mentally weak and this can get in their head, why not use it? 
Some people may say things over the top, but at the end of the day, as long as it's allowed, they're going to do it. In this case, it got to Bobby and he ended up chasing the guy across the field after giving him the ball for no reason. He could have just won the game, but he ended up hitting him for a penalty as well. So it showed that he wasn't able to control his emotions. It showed that it took him out of the game and he just acted in a bad behavior, bad character. And that's what sledging's meant to do. Trash talking can bring you down, but depending on how you respond, Going back to how self-talk or external talk to you, you can actually use this to your advantage. Get hyped up. Oh, you think you talking bad about my mama? Okay, so I'm gonna use that and show him that I'm the one to mess with. And then he sees on the field that I can't be touched. I ain't running any more of these three days, okay? Well, what I got to say, you really don't wanna hear cause honesty ain't too high upon your people priority list, right? Honesty? You want honesty? All right, honestly, I think you're nothing. Nothing but a pure waste of God-given talent. You don't listen to nobody, man. Not even Doc or Boone. Shiver push on the line every time, man. You blow right past them. Push them, pull them, do something. You can't run over everybody in this league. And every time you do, you leave one of your teammates hanging out to dry. Me in particular. Why should I give a hoot about you? Huh? Or anybody else out there? You want to talk about a waste, you the captain, right? Right. Captain's supposed to be the leader, right? Right. You got a job? I have a you job. You been doing your job? I've been doing my job. Then why don't you tell your white buddies to block for Rev better? Because they have not blocked for him. or for plug nickel, and you know it. Nobody plays, yourself included. I'm supposed to wear myself out for the team? What team? No. No, what I'm going to do is I'm going to look out for myself, and I'm going to get mine. Man, that's the worst attitude I ever heard. Attitude reflect leadership, Captain. All right, this last clip is from Remember the Titans. Now, this is an iconic movie, one of my favorite movies of all time, not just sports. Now, in this scene, you see Gary and Julius, the two main characters, going back and forth. Now, I'll give some preface that this took place in the 70s. It's based on a true story when racism in America was still at an all-time high. So the dynamic comes from a different place. It's not just they didn't get along. There's racial tension there. But the beauty of the overall movie that they end up coming together as a team and they went to win the state championship. But this particular scene, I want to touch on leadership and personality. You notice they exchange words Oh, let's just go through what we have to do because coach told us to. And then Gary gets on Julius for not playing with his all. But then Julius counteracts and says, no one's playing with their all. And even you, and you're the captain, right? And he asks him, are you doing your job? And he says, yeah. But it turns out that he's not really doing his job because everyone's failing at coming together. And a true leader shows by example. You can't just talk the talk. You also have to walk the walk. Now, in personality psychology, there's a measure that me and my colleagues use called the Hexaco personality measure. And one of the measures we use to predict mental toughness and other traits that are associated with high performers was extroversion. But it had a sub facet called social boldness that actually speaks more to this scene. Social boldness is a sub concept of extroversion because extroversion generally is seen as being on the scene, being active, being social. But it's more so being social in the sense that it provides you with the ability to perform at a higher level. Some people are extroverted when they need to perform, but not so much in just daily life. But in this case, social boldness means can you speak up, be a leader, take charge. And this is exactly what Gary needs to do. But since he's in his own head, he's kind of being selfish. He doesn't care. And at the end of the day, attitude reflects leadership. And he says this to Gary and he really thinks about it. And I think that's what leads to him finally coming around and they become best friends and has a pretty happy ending. Sadly, in real life, Gary ended up getting a bad car accident and becoming paralyzed. But the goal is he was able to step up as a leader and take his team. He even later in the movie, he would have to cut his best friend, which was pretty hard because he knew that's what a leader has to do. Make the tough decisions. All right, guys, I hope you enjoyed the video. Uh, this is great to do. It's pretty fun to talk about sports psychology, personality psychology, even cognitive psychology through the lens of movies and TV shows. And I look to do more of these. So if you want, put some in the comments below that you think would be good to do. And even if not, I might be able to figure it out because that's my job on the mental breakdown to do is to make sense of these different concepts. So make sure you like, comment and subscribe. And as always, thanks for letting me break it down and get your mind right.